time of communion together. Well, I appreciate very much um, uh, Lee Eklav stepping in last week, and he did so at, at my request because it allowed me to go to a pastor's conference and also to spend some time with family. And I certainly appreciate when we looked at chapter 16, his emphasis on the God who sees us. As we looked at the story of Hagar and Ishmael and Abram and Sarai and on that complicated story, it's good for us to be encouraged to have hope that God does see us in our circumstances. And so even in our prayer time this morning, it was mentioned that when we're alone, we're never truly alone because God is with us. He will not forsake us, and he does hear us. He does see us. He does speak to us. And it's good for us to remember that. And so we're going to turn to chapter 17, and I'm going to give you the sermon in a sentence, okay? <laughs> One sentence. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is what the sermon is about. So God makes his covenant promises to us. Okay, we're going to look at all of these. God makes his covenant promises to us. We are to receive his promises, and we'll talk about that, and walk in them. So the three primary points for this morning is remember his promises. Okay. We've been talking about this all of these weeks. Receive his promises. Thirdly, walk in his promises. And before we jump into our text, we want to take a little running start. And I want us to point us back to a few things in chapter 16. <laughs> the first one is, God does not need your help to fulfill his promises. I know, I know. Newsflash. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, but we know we've tried to do it, haven't we? Right? <laughs> God doesn't need your help in fulfilling his promises. He is more than capable of doing it himself. And actually, so often, when we try to help God, have you ever tried to help God before? Abram, you guys are laughing, right? Abram and Sarai tried to help God, right? Well, they figured out how they would be able to fulfill his promises, right? And they got in trouble, right? Same is true in our lives. Right? What are we to do? We to trust him. And if we're unclear, wait for his guidance and walk in what we know he's told us to do. Also, God does not ask us for our ideas. <laughs> he asks us for our obedience. I've read the Bible many, many times. I can't recall one time in when God is wondering what to do and asking his creatures for advice. Now, at times, he says, do what is what you think best, and he said that a couple times in Scripture. <laughs> but he doesn't come at our door and say, hey, you have any ideas for today? Right? I'm kind of out. Right? God doesn't ask for our ideas. He does indeed, again, ask for our obedience. He does have a plan. He is not lax in his work. He doesn't and has not overlooked some important detail. He calls to us and he says, follow me. Isn't that Jesus' invitation? Right? Follow me. It's an invitation that he extended to his creatures and extends to you today, will you follow me? That's what he asks of us. Often I ask God to join me in what I'm doing versus asking him, can I join him in what he's doing? Are you hearing me, right? right? I've gotten it wrong so many times. So I've learned, still learning, 
God, what are you doing? What are you saying? Help me to follow. Third thing from the last chapter I want us to remember, and we'll see it again in this chapter, God's grace covers our mistakes. I've had conversations with people saying, I miss God's will because I've made a mistake. Just like driving, just because we get off course doesn't mean we can re- can't return to course, right? God can redeem and does redeem those things even though there are consequences, right? And there are difficulties. We see that even with Ishmael. But God in His grace covers our mistakes. And that should give us hope, right? God, as you remember, redeems us. Redemption, just over the big story of the Bible. Creation, fall, redemption, recreation or restoration. And we and you and I can be thankful for God's grace. And I've made plenty of mistakes. Some little, some large. God's grace extends to you. Extends to you. Extends to you. To you. He is marvelous. And he invites us to be a part of his family. So here we go. First point of this chapter this morning. Remember his promises. And chapter 3 is, um, excuse me, chapter 17 is broken up kind of an intro thing, and we're going to talk about that. And if you see, depending on what version you have there, um, there's three main components of this chapter. God's saying, as for me, and reminds Abram what he has said he will do. By the way, this is the fifth time that God reminds him of his word, and you and I need to be reminded of God's promises, and we say amen, right? We're prone to forget We're prone to grow fuzzy in the details, and we must be as they were reminded time and time again. So it says, as for me, and then there's a section that starts, as for you, Abram. And then he says, as for you, Sarai. And has significant things to say to them, and significant things to say to us as well. Verse 1 of chapter 17 of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully. And be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you. And will greatly increase your numbers. Okay, We're going to pause there. Now if you remember, if you turn back, if you have a physical Bible in front of you. That chapter 16 ends with this sentence. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. And then the next chapter starts with when Abram was 99 years old. So it makes me pause. What happened from 86 to 99, right? Kind of just jumped that. What was that? A whole lot of things and a whole lot of no things. So if you remember back in the beginning, chapter 15 or 12, I should know this, no, 12, God spoke to him when he was 75, and we know a lot of things in those 10 years, and we've been looking at them, and then when he was 85, 
They tried to help God in fulfilling his promises. And when he was 86, this child was born. And then for 13 years we hear... Silence. So what are we to do with that? Here's some recommendations. When God is silent, live in the truth you know. Trust His timing and His plan. Remember what you have seen in the light when you are walking in darkness. You hear me? When you don't know what to do, when it's hard to know the next step, remember what you saw clearly and you know deeply and you're holding on with both hands. Remember that and continue to walk forward. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of even death, you are with me. Just because you cannot see God working does not mean he is not with you. Those of you who have walked through some dark times understand this deeply. Will you continue to walk in his promises and trust his plan? God's timing is perfect. Can you trust him that he knows a little bit more than you? Thank God for unanswered prayer. Does God answer prayer? Absolutely. But God, because he's a good father, just like us, if you've had children, I did not always answer my children's requests in the way that they want it. Dad, can we stay up another hour? No. Dad, can we eat ice cream for every meal? No. Dad, can I run out in the street anytime I want? No. You and I have a good father. Sometimes just like us poor representations of God our Father, sometimes we say yes, sometimes we say wait, sometimes we say no. Why? Because we understand clearer and things that our children don't understand. It's the same that's true of our lives. God understands more than you. He's working out his plan. Will you continue to trust him and follow him? Now in this instance, and maybe, why did God wait 13 years? Now it could be, and Hebrews tells us that in the time in which God spoke to him in this passage, it says his body was good as dead, meaning He was not physically able to have children. I'll say that. He wanted to make it very clear, right? And Sarai, we know, could not. And he says, I'm going to make it so clear that when this happens, both of you will know that this was a miracle. So we'll give you some time. My promise is still true. And they had to raise this child. And what was that like? We know the tension that was there, and that will come to play again. We'll see it in a couple weeks. Remember, God's delays are not God's denials. I read a uh, Jewish rabbi wrote a book on Isaiah. And he says, often we pray that we want everything. We want to have our health and we want to have freedom to enjoy it. We want to have money and we want ability to enjoy it. 
We want all of these things. And God often says you can have them, but you can't have them all at once. And you and I do not and cannot fully comprehend what is yet to come. We believe it because of God's promise to us that what he has is so mind-blowing that we do not have the capability in this fallen state to grasp what that will be. But he says, will you trust me because what I have is good, so good for you. So we walk and the truth we know to the light we cannot necessarily see yet, trusting that he is with us. And God is with you. He's with you. Abram had to learn this. Sarai had to learn this. We have to learn this. And at just the right time, and even in this story, it could have been just a normal day for Abram, and all of a sudden, there is God. He says, I am and I'm God Almighty, right? Not these itty bitty puny gods. I'm thinking of Loki here. You guys have seen that, you puny god. Okay, sorry. He says, I am God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. I am who I am. Abram, walk before me. Be in my presence. Know that I am seeing you. And if you do so, I will declare you blameless. By the way, when God sees you, he sees you through the life of Jesus Christ. Walk before So God reached out to him, and he says, I'm going to make a covenant for you. And if you remember a couple weeks ago, God made a covenant. Remember that? Cutting the animals in half? Remember that whole thing, right? God said very similar things. He expands it here to him, and we'll read it. And he made it on himself. This is what I'm going to do. And now there is this request of Abram. Now there's something I want you to do, and that's to receive my promises. And by doing so, there's something I want you to do that will designate you and this group of people different from those on the earth. And we're going to get to that. So he tells him again, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do these things. Let's read them in verse 3. So when God appeared to him, Abram, like you and I would have, fell face down. Face down. In honor and awe and worship. And God said to him, verse 4, as for me, there's that first, as for me, as for me. This is my covenant with you, Abram. You will be the father of many nations. We've heard this before. Now, here's something new. No longer will your na name be called Abram, which means exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, which is an extension, a father of many nations. When we interact with God, it changes us. He gave him a new identity, a new calling, not based upon Abram's goodness, but on God's promise. Are you hearing me? Right? This is who you're called, but this is what I call you. God changes us, and he says, Abram, we're getting close, and I'm changing your name now to Abraham, for I made you, I have made you. A father of many nations. Who is doing the act of working here? God is. And you'll see I, 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 I all over this. I will make you very fruitful. This is to a 
quote unquote, dead man. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant. This is new information. It's going to be everlasting, Abraham. And it's between me, and it's between you, and it includes your descendants after you for all of the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Verse 8. And again, Abram, this whole land of Canaan, and we talked about this, we've seen this, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants after you. I will be their God. These are all the things that God said he would do. And he meant them and God's promises to you and to me. He means them and he is fully capable of fulfilling them. When Jesus said he's coming back, he's coming back. It's not a fairy tale made up by Preachers and pastors and people who want your money. That's nonsense. It was given by God Almighty. And when he says, I will go and prepare a place for you, he has done so. And he will come back when he desires to do so at just the right time. He came the first time and at just the right time, he's going to come again. Believe this promise. God says he will do these things. And when we come into his family, grateful that Margie read the the passage this morning in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. A new name. Just for fun, I went into a Uh, A a site called LinkedIn. It's a professional place for professionals to build networks. And I typed in David Spooner. You know how many David Spooners there are on LinkedIn? 152. I don't know. I was thinking maybe I'll have a Dave Spooner convention. We'll just get us all together. Hey, let's get together. We don't need name tags. This will be amazing. You should go do that with your name. It's pretty funny, right? I was looking at all these guys. They're like, wait a second. That doesn't even look like me, right? So in one sense, your name is unique. But in another sense, your name isn't unique, right? But when co- God calls you by name, his name for you, there's going to be no duplicates specifically tailored for you. And we don't know it. What God calls you, that's what you are. You understand you're beloved. Do you understand that? Chosen. Redeemed. Precious. To Him. If you're a parent with a good heart, all your children are precious to you. Precious to you. Multiply that times a thousand times that by infinity get us an understanding of God's heart to us. And God will tell us what we need to know when we need to know it. (laughs) Sometimes God tells us what will happen, but he does not always tell us how it will happen or when it will happen. You say amen to that, right? Will you trust him? 
And we can see even in this interaction of God with this man, now named Abraham, God gives him more details as he went along. For instance, if you can go to the slides, please, the next slide. promise of the land, and you can go back and look chapter verses, you can't read the small print. The land that I will show you, he told them initially in Genesis chapter 12. Go to the land I'm going to show you. That's all the details he's given. Will he follow? And God, by the way, doesn't give you all the details either. It gives you enough that you know to take the next step. And then he told them, Now that he moved to this place, the land that you will see. And by the way, we can't go farther down that unless we take the first step of what we need to know today. Are you hearing me? God, I want to know the end of this. Well, you got to start where? At the beginning. If you're unwilling to take the first step, you will never make the last step in your journey of faith. As Abram moved forward, says, now, Abram, you see this land as he was there? This what you can see. And then he told him more details from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River, all of this. It was more and more and more details. Go to the next slide, please. This is the promise of descendants. Remember, in chapter 12, the initial promise was, I will make you a great nation. And then in chapter 13, he says, I will give you descendants. And then he told Abram, I will give you a son. Now, I went back to chapter 15. He could have told Abram right there. And by the way, it's going to come through Sarai. You, he could have told him that. Right? He, didn't, he didn't tell him that. He could have, they, they could have like not had the whole Ishmael Hagar thing. God could have said that right then. Why did he withhold that piece of information? It was an opportunity for Abram's character to grow and become mature. What are you going to do? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to take matters in your own hand? Abram learned from this as we also hopefully learn from our mistakes. God redeems them. And then finally, he tells Abram, and we're going to see this, that you will have a son through Sarai. Now, Sarah. That's the one, and we're getting close. You see how this works and God's promises to him and we could say see the same as we see in Christ and how all of these things came down the promises get very very specific and the same is true in our lives so the question is will you be willing to take the first step of faith trusting that where he leads you is going to be good that's the question God does not always give the details, but he guarantees the destination. I don't know how your life is going to unfold. I don't know what's going to happen even this afternoon. have my plans, but I don't know all the details, but I trust God's going to work it. And I don't know what's going to happen 20 years from now and 40 years from now, but I do know that the destination is going to be good. And the journey will be worth it of following him. Does that make sense? Thank you. So God will do what he says he's going to do. And God extends an invitation to us, to you. And then we are responsible for what? Receiving his promises. What does this look like? Let's go to the next major point. Let's receive his promises. Verse 9 of chapter 17 of Genesis. And then God said to Abraham, As for you, this is your 
responsibility. You must keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you for generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. It's going to sound kind of strange. (laughs) Every male among you shall be circumcised. Okay? You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whoever whoever is born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, let's pause. What is this about? Well, as I noted before, God promises to do certain things. And then he invites us into a gives us an invitation to join with him to believe his promises. And in doing so, there is a setting apart of this group of people saying, these are my people, the sign of the covenant. And initially, it was done in the flesh of a physical body. And the consequences were serious. If you don't do this, you'll be cut off from my people, which means you're cut off from the promises. So there is an emphasis on receiving God's covenant and there being a cutting away of the old. And so Jewish people from this point until those who are strictly mm, a Jewish Orthodox today This happens, circumcision of the males. As a Jewish rite saying, you are part of the people of God or of Abraham. Now, if you read the Old Testament, and you'll see in it, and I did this, I typed in the word circumcision, circumcision, I can't even say it, I typed in that word, and all of the places that it was in the Old Testament. And then there's these times in which God says, this circumcision, the cutting away, it's not really about the body at all. It's about your heart. A circumcision of the heart. And you'll see this in the New Testament. And there's scripture after scripture after scripture that talks about what this means. For instance, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Paul is talking to those in this city, right? And it's really, that whole book is about walking in the Spirit or walking in the flesh. And they were thinking that their identification of the people of God had to do with a physical circumcision. And he's saying, what are you talking about? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. That's what matters. Verse 15 of Galatians 6, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. The Jews really had a really hard problem with this. Even in the the church age where Jesus came, he spoke, he taught, he died, he resurrected, he ascended. The gospel was being preached all over the place, and they started first in the synagogues. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they're like, okay, well, what do we do to follow him? And they're like, well, you got to get circumcised, right? Because that 
that says that you're a Christian. And there was argument about it. And they came back to the apostles and said, hey, what should we do? And they prayed and they thought about it. And obviously the Holy Spirit helped them and says, you know what? You're not saved because you do anything physically to your body. You're saved when God circumcises your heart, giving, uh, taking away the old flesh or the old nature and making us new by His Spirit. That's what matters. So in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes in, and you'll see this. It's a circumcision of the heart. God removes the old nature, gives us a new nature, and then tells us to walk according to it. Romans 2, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is mere, merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, a child of promise, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from men, but by God. So here's the deal. When God offers His invitation of salvation to be a part of His covenant community, that we become children of God, you and I have a responsibility to either reject that invitation or receive that invitation. And if you and I receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He gives us a new nature and changes us from the inside and then tells us to walk according to His Word. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Is this making sense? Does going to church make you a Christian? Does being baptized make you a Christian? Is going to church important? No. Is being baptized important? No. So what makes you a Christian? Believing. Believing God's promises. Making Jesus Lord. A change of our heart. I knew about Jesus when I was young. I decided to follow Jesus when I was 17. God, I can't live this way. God, I continue to sin. God, I can't change me. You have to change me. You have to forgive me. You have to make me new. How to receive you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. The Holy Spirit changes, gives us new desires. Now, does that mean I don't sin anymore? <laughs> I wish that was true. But He gave you and me a new nature. And I've been learning to walk according to that nature. Walk in it. Do this, Abram. Do this, people. And you'll see that in the book of Galatians. And more than likely, we're going to go to that at the end of this series because it matches up with it perfectly. Walking by the Spirit. So if you go to the next slide, please. Oh, there's one more verse I skipped. That's okay. That one. Thank you. You can't read the small letters. Sorry. Old Covenant, Circumcision, a demarcation of these people have received me in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. It is God giving us a new heart so that there's change, so that there's life, so there's abiding and fruit and connection. God knows who are His, and how do we know? He's given us a seal, the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing what is to come. Right? You understand this. And then Galatians, and we'll go there. We'll, that more than likely be the next series, Walk According to the Spirit. This is important stuff. Here's another illustration. It's the best I could do. Okay. For instance, when I was in high school, 
we were invited to be a part of the football team. Everyone was invited to be the football team. Just like, oh, you jumped the gun, but it's okay. That, <laughs> no, you can go back, it's fine. <laughs> I found this picture in a, you can go to it. Yeah, who is that young kid? That's actually a 30-year-old picture of someone that you might know. Okay. Everyone gave us an invitation. The coaches gave us an invitation to be a part of the football team. Went out to everyone, just like the invitation to be a part of God's family goes out to everyone. Now, not everyone in my high school responded to be a part of that. Right? But those who re responded to the invitation, they got something called a jersey, right? A number that says, this person now is a part of the team. We did, and if we did what he told us to do, usually it turned out well. Do you understand this? So just because you hear the gospel doesn't mean you've received the gospel. We want everyone and all nations an opportunity to hear the invitation. And the question is, are we going to receive those things? And this is what he offered to Abram. He said, do these things. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Now walk in. Excuse me. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Okay. And then... God said this to Abraham now. He says, as for me, I'm going to do these promises. As for you, you need to respond to me. Just like we need to respond to the gospel. Have God change our hearts. Verse 15, God also said to Abraham, Now for Sarai, your wife, I've not forgotten her. You are no longer to call her Sarai, which means princess. Her name will be Sarah, which means my princess. He says, I am claiming her. Name changed because she was part of the covenant community. And I will bless her and will surely give her a son, give you a son by her, Abraham. I will bless her that she will be the mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. Now, verse 17, Abram fell face down. And he laughed. And he said... Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? He still thought at this point that Ishmael probably is the one. Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Then Abraham said to God, only if Ishmael might be living under your blessing. Verse 19, God said, Yes, I'll bless him, but your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac, which means laughter, by the way. We'll talk about that. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant, a son of the promise, right? for his descendants are after him. Now, as for Ishmael, I've heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him also fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers. By the way, Ishmael was the father of 12 tribes. There is a blessing for him, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. Specifics. Then he had finished speaking with Abraham. God went up from him. God will tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. God's blessing is to you, but it's also through you. Do you understand this? Believing, receiving, walking in it. God, do your work, do your stuff that you and only you can do. Christianity is not a self-help religion. It's a God transformational relationship. He changes us. Gives us a new heart. 
You can't make your flesh, your old nature, any better. You just have to deny it and crucify it. And then walk according to the Spirit. So God's blessing extended. And lastly, and this is what we see in Abram, walk in his promises. There was a believing, hearing, knowing the promise, just like salvation, just like the gospel to us. And there is a response required in which people believe it. And then once you believe it, God changes our hearts, getting rid of the old nature by his spirit. And then he says, follow me. Walk in this promises. So Abram did just that. Abraham, excuse me, on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael, all those born in his household, are bought with his money, every male in his household, circumcised them. God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when this occurred to him. And his son Ishmael, 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were born, were both circumcised that very day. And every male in Abraham's household, including those born in his household, or brought from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. And following God, there is a leaving the old and embracing the new. Does this make sense? Okay. Now granted, we're in process, and granted, our minds being transformed, and granted, we still make mistakes at time. Even Abraham does, and we'll see in a couple weeks, he relapsed and does the same sin he did before he did it again. Lying about the identity of his relationship with Sarah. Read ahead, you'll see it. And there are times in which we fall back into old sinful patterns, but that is not who we are anymore. Read the book of Romans, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, where our identity comes in. Believe in the new name God has called you. He's called you his daughter. He's called you his son. He called you to himself. That's who you really are. Live in it. Follow in the footsteps of the Spirit. Live that way. Remind yourself of God's promises. Why we come? What's one of the reasons why we come to church? One of the reasons why we read Scripture, remind ourselves, renew our minds. Receive His Spirit in your heart through faith. Walk before Him. Relationship, knowing Him, trusting Him, following Him, embracing Him, and serving Him. And I'm not sure how that looks for you. And I'm not sure where you're at with that this morning. You may think, well, I go to church, therefore I'm a Christian. If you go to church, that makes you a church goer. It's a good thing. But going to church won't save you. Only Jesus will save you. Only believing Christ will save you. And perhaps you said, you know what, I've been going to church for a long time, but I, I haven't, like, believed, believed. Today's your day. I want to talk to you about that. God, change my heart, change my mind. Renew me. And I don't know what that looks like for you this day, and I know some of you are holding on to promises. My response is, I believe God's word to you is, hold on and keep going. He will not fail you, nor will he ever. So we are going to renew the covenant, in in a sense, in through communion. Bob is going to lead us in that. And here he comes.